Recording now, it's recording. Welcome. Okay, lecture 1B Introduction to Strategic Management. Our objectives are over the next 45 minutes or so to introduce the model of strategic management, to define the key terms strategic competitiveness, strategic advantage, competitive advantage, above average returns, and the strategic management process. We're going to discuss briefly two models of um, how a firm can achieve above average returns. We're going to identify what a vision is and what a mission is. And as you can, as we discussed in the break between the two lectures, and as we'll try to get to today, but it's definitely one of your foreign activities. We want you to look at, a, identify a company, and look at a vision and a mission, and evaluate it. Um, and evaluate how, what role that may pay in, play in setting the strategic mission of the company and strategic direction of the company and identify and discuss the five main stakeholder groups. I feel I'm rushing in the way I'm talking, so I'll try to slow down a little bit. In the tutorial, that's what we're doing. And that's posted on the website. So the tutorial next week, we're looking at strategic leaders, we're looking at those things, but look at the specific actions that we're taking. So, what is the strategic management process? In Lecture 1A, I talked about how we're dividing this unit into strategic inputs or strategic context, strategic actions, which is formulation and implementation, and how that the main thing that we, the main purpose of strategic management was to produce strategic competitiveness or above average returns shouldn't say or, strategic competitiveness and above average returns. So this model that's up on the screen at the moment is the Hit Island model. It's a linear model of the strategic management process. There's several models that are similar to this. There's several other ways of doing strategy. We're not talking about those other ways, things like design theory, consequentialism, incrementalism, things like that. We're not gonna do with the, deal with those. We're looking at this particular model because it's a widely used model if you're doing accounting as your professional area, it's the model that's used as the basis of the strategic uh, strategy formulation um, stra st global strategy um, unit in their in the CPA and the chartered uh, accreditation professional years. If you're doing it, if you're doing your personnel, want to have a personnel career or a human resources career, RE use the same model. So we're not going to deal with every single item here in the course. The course is, is, is 12 weeks long, but we are going to deal with most of them. And in the lecture 1A, I went through what we were going to be dealing with, which areas we were going to deal with, but we're going to follow this structure through the unit. So let's start with the definitions I promised that we'd give. The strategic management process is a rational linear approach that firms use to achieve strategic competitiveness and earn above average returns. Strategic competitiveness and above average returns I'll define in a minute. The first part of the strategic management process is strategic inputs. That's analysis of the internal and external environment. The internal environment, what is inside the firm, the external environment, what's outside the firm. You will have probably heard in other courses of SWOT analysis, yeah. strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, yeah. which in another model is called TOES analysis, which is exactly the same meaning, just in another order. Strengths and weaknesses are what the firm has, so that comes from analysing our internal environment. Opportunities and threats are the external environment. The firm established its strategic intent and its strategic mission. A strategic intent and a strategic mission are the direction the firm is going to go in, what it intends to be, and I'm going to define them in more depth. To achieve that, you take your inputs, you leverage for resources, capabilities and competencies so that you win competitive battles so that you are strategically competitive. The process 
The next step of the process is strategy formulation. And strategies are formulated for business level, for corporate level, whether you have an acquisition and a restructuring strategy, whether you have an international strategy, corporate strategy. But more modern strategic management also talks about competitive dynamics. When strategic management first started, it was this, which was in the early 1960s. It started because prior to that, all people had talked about was long range planning and budgeting. And strategy was something that the military did. You can almost attribute the development of strategic management as, a, as an area to John F. Kennedy. When he said that they were going to go to the moon by the end of the de decade, and in fact this first strategic management course was a, in a business school was in 1968 at Harvard. We'll go, to the, the, um, we'll go to the moon by the end of the decade. Only objective, no pathway, nothing to plan, no organisation. All these things didn't exist when most of the previous models of planning had been based on moving things a bit by bit forward towards a series of short-term objectives, maybe or focusing on how you have long-term budgets, right? This was a new way of viewing how you managed a firm. So in the early periods of strategic management, they only focused on that new way of doing it. But, and so everything was long-term set your direction, you went in your direction. It's not just short-term responses, it's long. But in a modern competitive environment, there's attack and response. You have to have, there's a competitive dynamic that's much shorter, that may lead you to change your strategies. So competitive dynamics over the last 20 years, I don't know if that's a long time for some of you, over the last 20 years has become far more part of strategy formulation. And we're going to spend a week on that. Implementing strategies. Um, strategies for governance, strategies for restructuring and control, strategies for leadership, strategies possibly for entrepreneurship. Implementing strategies and the feedback and control feeds back into that model that we had at the beginning, this model here. Inputs, formulation and implementation leading to above average returns and strategic competitiveness if you're successful, leading to a feedback loop that may change your perception of the internal and external environment. May change your intent and mission and then may change the strategies and formulations that you do. Strategy formulation, strategy implementation. That's the strategic management process. So what is strategy? Strategy is an integrated and coordinated set of commitments and actions designed to exploit a core competency or core competencies and achieve competitive advantage that may lead you to having above average returns. The reason that it stops in this definition at competitive advantage even though the model says above average returns is because of course it can be applied to both for-profit and not-for-profit companies. That's what competitive advantage is. But in reality even most not-for-profit companies and organisations have budgets or they're competing with other not-for-profits or they're doing some type of service delivery that has to be managed. Or they're raising funds. Strategic competitiveness is the successful formulation and implementation of a value creating strategy. Of a value creating strategy. A strategy that creates value to whoever you're selling to or whoever you're providing a service to. By achieving strategy, so that they'll want to engage with it. By achieving strategic competitiveness and successfully exploiting its competitive advantage, a firm is able to get its main objective, which is its mission. So, how do you gain value? How do you gain competitive advantage? Well, you get it because you get competitive advantage when you implement a strategy that the competitors are unable to duplicate or find too costly to imitate. 
When we do our resource based view, looking inside the firm later in week three, I'm going to say, well, a com competency is something that's valuable, that's rare, that's hard to imitate, and non substitutable. So if you have something that's valuable, hard to imitate, the valuable sort of customers want it, uh, rare, so only you've got it, non substitutable, and hard to imitate. That gives you a sustainable competitive advantage because your competitors can't get that, at least in the short term. But there are very few competencies that meet all of those four criteria and some combination of those competencies can lead to temporary competitive advantage or competitive parity or even competitive disadvantage by combining whether something's valuable, rare, hard to imitate or costly to imitate and non-substitutable. Above average returns are returns in excess of what the investor thinks they need to get related to the risk in an area. Remember, risk is something that's perceived by the investor and industries have different perception of risk. People have different perception of risk in different industries. Risk, the investor's uncertainty about economic gains or losses that result from a particular investment. Average returns are those returns that are what you get for the same amount of risk, perception of risk. Above average returns are higher than that. Having a competitive advantage means that you're, that, uh, that, sorry, I'll start it again. If you don't have a competitive advantage or that you're not competing in an industry that's attractive, you can only get average returns. because someone else is going to make above average returns. Make sense? If you're not, a, but if you're, sometimes if you're in an attractive industry, everyone's making above average returns. I mean, if you're a tissue manufacturer at the moment, you probably charge whatever you want to Woolworths, couldn't you? Yes. Well, not exactly, but you know, we're not going to see half price tissues to customers at the moment, are we? Though in the first week of the shortage, there was half price issues because it was a, just a normal sale. Um, I did notice yesterday at Woolworths in the city that there was lots of cans of salmon for $2.20, but no cans of tuna because Serena tuna had been half price. But then there was hardly anything anywhere in Woolworths in the city. And this morning when I got in to park in QV, um, there was, um, it was before eight o'clock, so there was all these people that pre were pretending to be on disability pensions or old or something. And then there was this enormous queue of maybe a hundred people about wa waiting in the queue to enter Woolworths. Um, okay. Strategic management process is the full set of commitments, decisions, and actions required for a firm to achieve competitiveness and above average returns. Commitments, what you're gonna do, what you agreed to do, what you intend to do, what you're gonna support in your organization, decisions, how are you gonna do it, what managers say they're gonna do, and actions, what actually happens to achieve a full set uh, of strategic competitiveness, to achieve strategic competitiveness and earn above average returns. Conventional sources of competitive advantage, competitive advantage are changing. You used to gain competitive advantage because you had something that you controlled. You had land, you had a property, you had a license. You had barriers. Now there are other things and you can access other people's value chains, other people's, other companies um, through cooperation that might mean you are competitive. And you outsource things you don't think you're very good at or you buy it. You have a global supply chain. So there's been a shift in the way management works and strategic management works. And I don't think that'll be new to you because people have said that in other units to you, haven't they? The things change. The old style model of strategic management was called the industrial organisation model. That's when you took something and you converted it and you produced an output. The old style model of industrial organisation means that you looked at an industry 
that the industry rather was more important than the firm on the performance. So the determinants of the firm and firm's performance were things like economies of scale, barriers to market entry, and how diverse you were, and product differentiation, and degree of concentration on the, on, of the firms in, in, in the industry. Now I'm not saying those things aren't important because we're going to talk about how they are important, but the alternate view of um, the firm is the resource-based view. Yes, and I know I just jumped over six slides that you'll need to know. And for people online, I just jumped over six slides that you'll need to know. The alternate view of the firm is the resource-based model of above average returns. The resource-based model assumes that every organisation is a collection of unique resources and, un and capabilities. You combine those unique resources and capabilities. You use those unique resources and capabilities as your strategy and that will be the primary determinant of your, your performance. Valuable, rare, non-substitutable, hard to imitate competencies based on your resources and capabilities lead you to having above average returns. That the differences in the firm's performance are primarily due to their unique resources and the capabilities rather than the structural characteristics of the industry. Remember that models are simplifications of reality. Models are simplifications of reality. So therefore, maybe those two extremes aren't always true. And in fact, you could argue that in different industries that might, might be, but both can be true. So, the difference between the two, and I've gone back now to the table from your textbook, slide 70, 17. The industrial organisation model of above average returns says you study the external environment, especially the industry environment. Locate an industry in which has a high potential to get above average returns. Identify a strategy that is called for to, by the attractive industry to get those above average returns. Develop the assets, the skills, or acquire the assets and the skills to implement that strategy and use the firm's strengths that you now have to develop the acquired, um, the, which is the acquired assets and skills to implement the strategy. So remember those five steps and where they start from and where they end. Because we're now going to go flick through quickly, skipping over slides you'll need to know, to the resource-based view of the firm. Identify the, res starts a different end. Identify the resources. Study the strengths and weaknesses compared with those of competitors. Determine the firm's capabilities. What do the capabilities allow the firm to do better than its competitors? Determine the potential of the firm's resources and capabilities in terms of competitive advantage. Valuable, rare, hard to imitate, a costly to imitate, non-substitutable. Locate an attractive industry that matches the, the resources and capabilities and things that you do. Select a strategy that best allows the firm to utilize its resources and capabilities relative to the opportunities in the external environment. Now when we analyze, when we go forward and we're going to analyze the external and internal environment, we're going to look at both. But as we go through the course, the unit, we're going to take a more resource-based view of the firm. So, Just flick too far. The next objective was to talk about mission and vision. Not all organisations have separate or easily separable missions and visions. A vision 
of the organisation is a picture of where the firm wants to be and in broad terms what it ultimately wants to achieve. Where it wants to be and in broad terms what it ultimately wants to achieve. It's often quite short. It often reflects values and aspirations. It captures, designed to capture the hearts and mind of the employees and possibly other stakeholders, customers, suppliers, government, investors. And it's designed to stretch and challenge people in the organisation. They're often quite short. The vision statement of Australia Post used to be, we deliver. The reason the vision and Australian statement of Australia Post used to be we deliver was because they didn't care how they delivered. They would use a mix of public or private. They just wanted to deliver. They were cri Post offices are criticised all the time as being hopeless, aren't they? Except the Australia Post's performance was always already better than every public sector comparator. It was the best post office in delivery time in the world. It got into trouble once because it didn't up its performance indicators high enough when they were already in the high 90s. FedEx was pushing to get 80%. They just looked good at that time compared with the U US Post. So we deliver. They wanted to convince their customers that. They didn't want to limit themselves to one area or another area. How do we deliver? Do we deliver online? Do we deliver through our stores? Do we deliver through private sector outlets or public sector outlets? Do we use contractors or do we use trucks or do we use airplanes? Do we establish a courier company, which is Star Trek, which they established jointly with Qantas but now fully own? All those type of things. They, do we, we, to deliver, we need logistics centres. We do our own logistics. We outsource, we have, provide outsourced logistics to other companies. All of that was this vision. But none of the things I just said were necessarily part of the nitty gritty bit of the vision. They were probably elsewhere in their goals as they tried to achieve their vision. Um, I've, I've said that. Apple's vision. We believe that we are on the face of the earth to make great products and that's not changing. Australia Post's new vision is, in our long history, our social purpose and commitment to the community remains the same, to create connections and opportunities that matter to every Australian. That's why they have the online box. That's why they have the online uh, ID service. That's why they have a whole range of different services at the, po at the post offices. That's why they have these possibly unprofitable, really important partnerships with banks with private providers, with local post offices, with local post agents. That's why they're moving to electric bikes. They're doing all these things about connection. Their vision is, is longer a sentence now, but still quite short. When I first studied strategy, the vision, the vision statement we used to have to tell people was the vision statement of SAS Airlines, Scandinavian Air Service. Their vision statement was to be the number one business airline in Europe. And the question they used to ask in training and we used to have in our textbooks was this. You are the customer service officer, the, like the head of the flight attendants, on the plane and you're talking to the pilot. You have discovered that the cough, it's, you're on the plane, it's a 6 a.m. flight out of Stockholm to go to, to Berlin. You have discovered that there's no coffee on the flight. There's tea, there's breakfast, but no coffee. It's going to take 30 minutes for the caterer to deliver the coffee. Do you take off on time or do you wait for the coffee? And the mission guides it. Who thinks you should take off on time? Nobody. Who thinks you should wait for the coffee? Okay, there's five people here not thinking. You wait for the coffee? No, no, no. Take off on time. What about you? Everyone's going to take off on time. No one waiting for the coffee. 
Why? That's right, because you're the number one business airline in Europe. That's your goal. And if you're on a plane at 6 a.m. in Stockholm, it's because you've got a meeting and you want to be there on time. So you take off on time and you apologise and offer everyone tea. If you're on Air Pacific, that's like Qantas own subsidiary that flies to Fiji, and it's 10 o'clock in the morning and there's no champagne on the plane, and it's going to take 30 minutes for the champagne to arrive, what do you do? Air Pacific flies to Fiji. What are most people going to Fiji for? Holidays. <laughs> so you wait for the champagne, don't you? That's as simple as the vision statement is. Yeah? It guides right down to the bottom. It guides decisions. The mission statement often has lower level or high level goals, often has multiple sentences in it and says specific things that they're going to do. Mission station specifies the business that you're in, the businesses that you intend to compete in, and often says something about the customers that they serve. Now, even that vision statement from SAS says stuff about the customers and stuff, stuff about the business it was in. Frequently, as I said, they include additional content. It's normally longer, it can be several paragraphs, it can be just a sentence. That Australia Post one sometimes is said that is actually the mission statement. McDonald's mission statement, to be the best employer, so it's talking about staff as stakeholders. For our people, that's the deliberate typo I have in every set of slides. So when people copy the slides in the exam, I know they don't understand. In each community around the world, we're a global company, but we're community focused and deliver operational excellence to our customers. What business they're in, who they're focused on, who their stakeholders are. That's in a sentence. Who are stakeholders? Well, let's define stakeholders. Stakeholders are individual and groups that can affect or be affected by the strategic outcomes achieved or who have enforceable claims on a firm's performance. There are lots and lots of different models of stakeholders. The one we're using is this one, that there's capital market stakeholders, product market stakeholders, organisational stakeholders, and the natural world. In other units, in other courses, you might do different stakeholder models. Model is a simplification of reality. We do a different model of stakeholders in ethics and corporate social responsibility that I also teach. So, who are the capital market st stakeholders? Their shareholders, their major suppliers of capital, like banks. They can sometimes be <coughs> people you don't actually think of. For example, the government is a major stake capital market stakeholder at the moment. The government bailed out the banks and guarantees banks. The government in the US is going to bail out Boeing and the airports, isn't it? Because of the COVID crisis, it's destroyed Boeing and it's destroyed um, the profitability of airports. It's probably going to supply tax. It's, it's also, but so that's what the US government's doing. So they can also be a capital market stakeholder. It's sources of capital. In charities, in not-for-profits, in government organisations, it can also be the government or it could be your um, donors, it could be a whole pile of people that are providing you with funds. But capital market stakeholders, that's what it means. The product market stakeholders are your main customers, your suppliers, your host communities, so the community, this town, the city you're in, and unions or other labour organisations, depending on the country you're in. And organisational stakeholders are the employees, managers and non-managers is how we're going to break it up in this class. The final stakeholder is how we treat the natural world. 
it's the world something to consume, just use the resources, or do we have a responsibility for clean air, or global warming, do it, climate change? And, the, and so the natural resources, should we be paying for, uh, how much we should be paying for things like um, um, uh, iron ore licenses and revenue to the government? Because the people own the land, the company's just developing it, yeah? What requirements do we have for companies to mitigate pollution or to um, reinstate the quality of land that they've left or to operate in a sustainable way? The people who prosecute, the people who represent, I suppose, natural resources and climate are government and environmental groups. And we're using that fairly broadly because, of course, you know, you wouldn't, scientists, like every scientist that basically says global warming's a problem and mad called, isn't an environmental group, it's a group of scientists. But those are the people that are supposed representing the national world, natural world. So, what have we done in that topic? Before we go to the tutorial, which is when I'm going to finish this, this uh, recording, we've introduced the model of strategic management and the strategic management process yes. that we're going to use. We defined our key terms. Yes. We discussed two models, and I jumped over some things that you have to go and revise yourself because they feed into next week's tutorial. We identified the vision and mission of the company and the roles played, and we identified the five main stakeholder groups. Okay, so that's what we've done in that lesson.